So once again, if you're just joining us, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Tarr, uh, at-large board member for the National Capital Area Chapter of APA. And I'm excited to have you all with us for our next session on our 2021 virtual chapter conference. Uh, this is extending the 15th Street cycle track through the National Mall, key factors of success. And we don't have overlapping sessions. So if you came to Tuesday's noon session, you're in the right place. Uh, before I hand it over to our panelists today, I uh, want to just give folks a couple of logistical notes. Uh, first of all, this uh, session has been approved for one CM credit. Uh, so if you need to log that credit after you have completed listening to this, uh, you are able to do so. There is a link to um, log your credit directly from our online agenda. Uh, second note, want to note that we are also recording this session, so you will have access after the fact to all of the recorded sessions in the conference, so you can listen again at your leisure. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over from here, so really excited to have you all, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Emily Oaksford, AICP of Nelson Nygaard, to get us started. Hello, everyone. You can see my screen, correct? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us today to um, hear about our project. Um, I'm Emily Oaksford. I'm a senior associate at Nelson Nygaard. I've been working in the planning fields for um, over 10 years and I've been at Nelson Nygaard for uh, just under two. And I must admit my passion for transportation planning extends beyond my job. I sat on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the uh, TPB at COG for the first three years. I lived in DC and I have served on DC's Bike Advisory Council for six years. Um, I'm a supporting planner on the project consulting team for the 15th Street um, Safety Improvement Project. And joined with me today are three other members of the project team, um, two uh, on the client side of the project team and the other um, on the consulting team. So. First, Eliza Voigt, uh, the branch chief for planning at GSA. Um, in her role at NPS, um, which she just left last month, she was the senior park planner at the National Mall and Memorial Parks in DC. Um, she has an MA in city and regional planning from UNC and is an adjunct professor at, at GWU, Sustainable Urban Planning graduate program. Uh, Will Hansfield is a planner and construction manager at DDOT, uh, District Department of Transportation, working to build bike facilities in DC. Um, he got his start in transportation in Denver um, in 2006 while earning an MA in public policy and has continued to work on sustainable transportation throughout his career. Uh, Will now lives uh, with his wife Karen and three children in Capitol Hill and gets around predominantly by walking, biking, and taking transit. Um, and finally, a Drusilla Van Hengel, a principal at Nelson Nygaard. Uh, Drew has more than 25 years of academic and practical transportation and operations experience. She's the project manager for the 15th Street Improvement Project. Um, and her consulting practice um, expertise is in the application of a safe systems approach to safe routes of school, vision zero, and pedestrian and bicycle planning and design. Uh, Drew is the active transportation sector co-lead uh, for Nelson Nygaard and an adjunct professor at Portland State University. And she also serves on the board of the Street Trust. And uh, before I dive into the agenda, I did um, want to also recognize that a number of other people were involved in the consulting project team, including the fine people um, at Kittleson Associates, Inspire Green, EXP, and ATCS. Uh, but the point of the presentation today was to bring together some of our project team, our project manager, Drew, and our two project managers, one at DDOT and one at NPS, to share with you how we navigated some kind of hefty requirements and approval processes, a tight construction and contract schedules, and can happily say that we're on track to finish this project um, at the end of the year with some already interim construction having begun. So the agenda today, first I'll give a little introduction and overview of the project and scope, and then we'll dive into what we see are kind of the, these kind of key factors um, for, for why we've been able to stay on track. Um, alignment of guiding documents and policies, coordination and communication across agencies, and effective public engagement and messaging around roadway reallocation. Um, so first, kind of diving in, what was the project goal? Well, this project looked at ways to improve the safety for vulnerable, vulnerable road users along the stretch of 15th Street that extended south from Pennsylvania Avenue at uh, the White House through the National Mall and onto National Park Service land to Ohio Drive. 
Um, the project looked to close an existing bikeway gap from 15th Street to the 14th Street Bridge. And once completed, the project will allow for a continually protected bike route from National Park Service Meridian Hill Park in Columbia Heights to the 14th Street Bridge into Virginia. Um, this project will allow bicyclists and other micromobility users to safely travel uh, along the National Mall, access the Tidal Basin and Hayes Point, and connect to other ideal bikeway infrastructure, including the Pennsylvania Ave cycle track and the Mount Vernon Trail in uh, Virginia, uh, just across the 14th Street Bridge. Um, this project is an agency collaboration between the District Department of Transportation and National Park Service. NPS and DDOT collaborated, has collaborated on projects in the past, um, such as Franklin Park in downtown DC at 13th and K. That's a prime example, just had the ribbon cutting uh, recently. Uh, but uniquely, this project spans across both DC and federal lands on roadway facilities. You know, as a user, a driver, walker, a biker, you wouldn't notice those jurisdictional boundaries, but the complexity does kind of arise on paper. And NPS and DDOT worked collaboratively together to prepare for this project, obtain funding, put out an RFP and on this project, they served duly as a client in order to advance the work and ensure that proper review and approval was met. Um, just for some baseline setting, you know, we wanna quickly review what we're talking about today when we talk about a cycle track, um, a two-way protected bikeway facility. So here are some examples. First from DC zone 15 street, the, you know, kind of point of the project where we're trying, where this project meant to extend. Um, and second in Chicago on uh, Dearborn, and then on the right is Seattle Second Ave bike lane, where there is a, you know, you can see significant, some significant uh, protection between the bike lane and the vehicle um, area. So just, you know, according to National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, uh, two-way protected bikeway infrastructure is recommended instead of typical bike lanes in a number of unique situations, many of which were very well aligned with the 15th Street uh, project. Um, so they're recommended along streets with high bike volumes, along streets with high motor vehicle volumes, um, high motor vehicle speeds. Um, cycle tracks are also recommended on streets where one side of the road or both um, could have, might have few driveways or cross street conflicts. Um, and they also work really well on one way streets where bike travel um, might be desired in the opposite direction, such as 15th street uh, for, for its Northern segment pre predecessor. Um, so the scope of this project uh, was divided into several phases. First, we examined the existing conditions for all road users on 15th Street and then com prepare, uh, compared them to projected future conditions uh, with the, uh, what would happen if the project was in place. Uh, the project team looked at roadway level of service and also analyzed crash data from specific hotspot intersections. Um, also identified the traffic volume and what, and identified the priority corridors for vehicles, trucks, and other kind of unique users because of uh, the, the road's location near the, and on the National Mall. Um, the second phase included a 100% design plans for an interim cycle track uh, that would include pedestrian improvements. The interim plan was needed uh, because the desired construction year was so immediate. Um, the construction was meant to tie into some already scheduled repaving and restriping plans. Um, and so the interim design did not have to include wholly permanent separation between the bike and the vehicle lanes, uh, but some aspects of the design really did have to become permanent due to, you know, safety, safety um, reasons. And in those cases, that's where we really feel like that coordination between DDOT and NPS was so important since we had to mobilize and determine how to approve and then execute a final de uh, design that, you know, for, you know, some specific examples, you know, required removal and relocation of historic granite curbs, um, unique elements along them all. And then the third phase of the project is where we're currently is to drop some concepts to refine the interim insulation and to, you know, further add protection um, that might not have been able to be done in the interim design. So that's some, things like are more complex, such as at intersections where curb relocation might have to occur. Um, and then the concept design set will go to DDOT and NPS for finalization and ultimate implementation. And of course, during the course of this project, it, um, we had a, a number of public involvement opportunities. We had two large public meetings and also a number of stakeholder meetings throughout the process. And now I'm going to kick it over to Liza to talk to our uh, about our first kind of key uh, key the guidance alignment aligning our guidance and policies. 
Great, thanks, Emily. So hi, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, since we're primarily planners here, this is a planning conference, we're gonna talk about the plans. Um, and we created a couple plans that led up to this project. First, we have the National Mall Plan, which was the 50 year guidance document for the National Mall, which is done in 2010. And you all can go online and take a look at it. And in terms of transportation, well, what it looked at, it looked at how to make the National Mall more sustainable, how to make it more visitor um, friendly, and, uh, and transportation was a part of those goals. Um, what we saw was that on the National Mall with the increase in visitors, um, there was more and more opportunity for conflicts along what is called our multi-use trails. So we are in the middle of Washington, D.C. And in the downtown D.C., you can't ride bikes or um, other motor vehicles, you know, pedaled uh, motor vehicles or scooters on sidewalks. On the National Mall, however, they're multi-use trails and there's more flexibility. So one of the goals of the National Mall was, was the opportunity to reduce these conflicts. And that would be to um, develop the single use um, cycle tracks or, or other um, trails where, where we would be separating these uses that could conflict with the growing um, increase in visitors. And um, as well, uh, we um, had established you know, since the National Mall plan, we established all the capital bike share, nine capital bike share stations on the National Mall, which have become um, some of the highest used um, bike stations in the 500 plus um, stations regionally. So what this says is more and more people want to use multimodal transportation to get around the National Mall. And so we have to provide um, the facilities for this. So after that was kind of defined in 2010 in the National Mall Plan, um, regionally, we undertook a paved trail study to look at all the parks inside the Beltway, um, you know, Rock Creek, uh, National Capitals East, GW, George Washington Memorial Parkway, National Mall, and kind of defined implementations, how we can actually implement um, some of these enhancements that needed to be done. Um, and, as a planner, I hope all of you, when you do plans, have this kind of implementation guide at the end and then go back and see you know, how to best do this. So we can go to the next slide. And that's what the paved trail study um, um, did. It was kind of an implementation guide over years. And one of the implementations was the 15th street cycle track. Um, and this of course aligned with DC um, because again, um, the National Mall is in the center of DC and everything connects. Uh, the National Mall has about 40 miles of roads, but as Emily stated, you know, as a visitor, as a resident, um, you don't know what roads are National Mall and what roads are um, DC. So we need to work to, um, together with DC in order to do these implementations. So you wanna do the next one, next slide. Um, so, yeah, so how we started this effort, so we had our plans and the plans had an implementation guide and plans are a form of um, defining collaboration, right? Because everyone gets together and comes together to come to a plan, right? So we would already gotten a lot of buy-in through our planning effort. Um, so how are we gonna fund this? Um, we looked at some of the options. Um, First, we undertook a um, transportation alternative program grant, which we did a little pilot program, which is also really important when trying to move these efforts forward. Um, south of the Jefferson Memorial, we did a small cycle track off of the 14th Street Bridge with what is called a TAP grant, Transportation Alternative Program. So once that was done, and again, DDOT helped us with that as well by sharing, you know, we worked with, with the design, the National Mall implemented it, but DDOT was right there with us in um, helping us design that. And then the next stage, we said, okay, we have this little uh, pilot um, cycle track that helps people get over the bridge and into DC from Virginia, you know, a major quarter, which about 2000 riders a day. So what are we gonna do next? 
how are we going to fund this implementation of the 15, the rest of 15th Street? And we looked to, we got a grant through the Federal Lands Access Program, another federal highway grant for about $500,000 that really helped this move from the, um, helped this really move to a real project. Um, and uh, that grant funding um, is, is really, it's geared to access to um, federal land. So this was a perfect implementation of that. And that really helped uh, pay for um, fully the design and having um, you know, the great expertise of Nygaard who has done this everywhere. So um, yeah, is that it, Emily? Great. All right, on to Will. Hi, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about how we coordinate between our various uh, agencies. So here's where the road is divided, right there at Constitution. North of Constitution is a DDOT road. Um, we are the, the custodian of all the district's uh, roadways, with the exception of NPS roadways. And that's that was what was um, the, the sort of ownership circumstance south of Constitution. Um, and so there's just you know a lot of cooks in the kitchen when, when those types of things happen. Um, and on top of that, we had a couple different repaving schedules. So what's what's best for um, sort of asset management and keeping, you know, building new facilities and, and keeping them in a really good state of repair is when we can line um, installation of a new bikeway uh, with one of these uh, repaving. So you basically start with the with the blank sheet of asphalt. So so DDOT's repaving in the summer of 2021 from Constitution North to, to Pennsylvania. And, and so we really wanted to, to meet that and um, uh, make sure that our new pattern, not only for the bikeway, but also for all the roadway markings could, could just be put down fresh and, and clean and, um, and not have to you know, work with existing conditions really. Um, and we were able to meet that by, by, by sort of accelerating the design. And then uh, NPS has a different repaving schedule. So they're going to be repaving from Constitution South, um, I think in two years time. So not immediately, but like pretty close to when we want to have this. Um, and then uh, I think in the next season, and starting in uh, right after Cherry Blossom, NPS is going to be repaving uh, on the on the bottom of that drawing, the dotted red line. Um, that's that's basically from the end of our our limits to the um, to the uh, pilot project that Liza was talking about in front of the Jefferson Memorial. So there's all these different schedules, and we're trying to um, coordinate exactly what's going to happen with each of them. So we came up with a scheme of like putting in certain materials on one port portion of the cycle track, and then we'll, we'll upgrade them later. And that's what we're showing here. So, um, so we had a good example. We had done in the prior year the Fourth Street um, protected bike lanes that use the barrier. You can see up in the top right, um, and then in the, the, the lower right, you can see um, the cycle track. Uh, I think that's the one at the, the along the uh, Jefferson. Um, so that's like the, the the pilot version, right? So it's using these rubber wheel stops. And again, we know that road is is slated for for reconstruction. Um, so when we know we, we, we don't have to worry about the uh, facility changing for a lot of years, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense to put in these big, large blocks of concrete that are basically, you know, very hard to move. Um, but if we're just going to, you know, in, in a year's time or two years time, have to move everything out of the way um, using these lighter rubber materials and, and, and flex with some other sort of light tack, we call them tactical materials because you can put them much more quickly. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's what we decided to do right now. Uh, Global supply chain issues. We're still waiting on our concrete blocks. They were supposed to be here in like October. So if you see cones in the section north of Constitution, that's why it's it's global supply chain disruption on the steel that goes into the uh, the reinforcing rebar steel on the uh, on those blocks. So so to tie us into the uh, the other things in the uh, global supply chain. But in the end, um, the north of Constitution is going to get that type of barrier, and then south of Constitution, we're we're currently working on this as part of our our long term planning effort for this this quarter using something like these granite curbs you see in the top right that's on a, a portion of 15th street um, between v and w street northwest um, we also were able to um, for, for safety reasons reconfigure the bus boarding operations so um, it used to be buses would pull into this sort of space right here uh, we were able to instead to build these large bus islands they're 100 feet long 12 feet wide and that's going to be a big bus boarding platform for the circulator and the big buses that serve them um, so that was really our, our sort of biggest construction effort on the court. We have three of those um, cigar and hot dog shaped bus platforms and, uh, and those are in. And, and it, it keeps the cyclists in a very protected space um, where there's a known conflict point between you know, bus boarding and everything else. Um, so that's the type of uh, uh, thinking that's, that's gotten into this. We also had a lot of cooks in the kitchen, as I said. Um, not only is there DDOT and NPS, um, 
there was also the National Capital Planning Commission, uh, the Commission for the Fine Arts, and um, along the White House portion itself, there's the, the Secret Service as an entrance along this area. Um, we have transit buses, we had uh, motor coaches using the, the curbside there, and we had vendors using the curbside there. Um, and then we had to go through environmental review, federal review, and then sort of an operational review between, between everybody. So um, we had a, a lot of, of different, you know, planning efforts going in different directions at different times. But again, going back to why it works so well and, and start to finish, we awarded the contract um, uh, to Nelson Nygaard in September of 2020. And by August, actually, by, yeah, by August 2020, we're, we're building this facility, right? But they had no plans to start. It was just like an idea. So to go in 11 months to, to like a fit, or actually it was more like 10 months to a finished construction plan is, is a very rapid pace, um, especially with all these coordination efforts. So it, it really worked well. And it's because at the outset, um, what Eliza was talking about, we had our plans in alignment. Our Move DC plan was in line with the capital, uh, the capital Trails plan and the National Mall plan and the implementation um, that, that, that NPS helped us to arrange. Um, so it, that's to, to say a lot for the, the uh, planning in the beginning and how you can, you can take something more quickly than, than is typical from, uh, from just an, an idea uh, to something really real that's, that's out there on the street and people are using today. Um, I think uh, that would, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Drew at this point to talk about the messaging and how we communicated some of these things. Great, thank you, Will. Um, yeah, Eliza and Will both conveyed how they served up a project to us that was really ready to go due to the plan alignment and the coordinated relationships and understandings of, of this really complex environment. Um, and part of that work was, um, so part of our hardest work was to, to determine how to, to actually communicate with internal stakeholders and the public about the potential impacts of this project. So in this part of the presentation, I want to describe how we evaluated and communicated about the project as it advanced. It was important to specify that the project being born out of the many planning efforts that we heard about already today is being advanced as a way to more equi equitably support all people moving along and across 15th Street. The project had three goals that relate to overall city and national park service policies, safety, ease of use, and balancing delay and access. These metrics were consistent with the, the mobility and safety goals that um, DDOT holds and are imperative um, of the Vision Zero effort as well. The 15th Street corridor contains several unsafe intersections because of permissive vehicle turning movements, a high, high pedestrian volumes, and uh, the lack of dedicated space for bicyclists, especially during the um, cherry blossom season when the NPS trail becomes very, very crowded. And, um, and so we tried first to convey this, these three metrics of safety, a safe right of way for people, regardless of whether they're walking, biking, or driving, ease of use, um, which um, was defined as improved function of the street and intersections to make them easier to use and understand, and this balance of access and delay. And this was a, um, this is where um, this project really stood apart from other projects that we have worked on, where it was clear from the very start that the there was not a primary metric about um, regarding delay. There were lots of other streets where passenger cars and through movements could be better accommodated than this um, front door to some of the most um, valued assets in the country. So this access and delay metric is about balancing travel delay with right of way capacity and providing access for everyone who uses the street regardless of, of um, what mode they're using. So on the next slide, um, we described that we communicated that creating dedicated lanes for people on bikes will make the road more legible for all people moving moving along the corridor. Even though bicycling was a top line on our project, it's called the Protected Bike Lane Project, all DDOT bike lane projects provide opportunities for multimodal safety by um, evaluating how to de-conflict turning movements and to create um, slower speeds along the streets. We described Walker Willa, who wishes the mall pathways could be dedicated to people walking so as to make her visits there more relaxing, to biker B, who sometimes takes the bike instead of Metro, but might feel uncomfortable riding between the White House and the 14th Street Bridge because there isn't a dedicated separated facility for her, to driver Dana, who feels like people on bikes pop up out of nowhere and make the drive chaotic, to tourist Tom, who wants to be able to focus on historic sites along the mall as he pops on and off of the circulator. We were clear that we anticipated this, that this project needed to balance access, capacity, and delay. 
We use this graphic in an early um, community-wide meeting as a means of communicating that by making some basic assumptions about sidewalk, bike lane, and general purpose lane capacity, today's line, lane assignment provides a capacity for 22,400 people per hour due to its heavy assignment to motor vehicles. With a balance, rebalance, rebalancing of the right-of-way, which is shown on the right side, the street can serve 26% more people or about 28,000 per hour. In other words, heavy demand for access to the National Park Service assets can be served by using the same amount of space to serve more people. We were really also very clear from the very start that, that vehicular level of service decline would be anticipated and that DDOT and NPS both were choosing to do this anyway because providing safe and connected bikeways and walkways that support short local trips requires a change in the way that the parking lanes are assigned. So we communicated this both in our public facing materials and we had lots of conversations with the early stakeholder with the stakeholder groups as they as we move through the process to reassure that the consistency of this project with um, both NPS and DDOT uh, goals. On the next slide, um, we described how we tried to make it, uh, we're describing how we tried to make it clear and not overly complicated in showing how we assess the outcomes of the decisions made during this design in the accordance with the three metrics, which I described earlier. Importantly, we shared that the evaluation applied to all modes, not only cars. And then final slide, we'll just describe that um, there were some, you saw some mixed results in the, in the earlier, earlier slide. Walk, the walking um, experience um, that uh, was changed as a result of deconflicting movements with additional um, uh, phases for um, removing permitted left turn lanes for cars moving across the bikeways that did lead to lengthier delays at Madison and Jeff Jefferson in exchange for um, the pedestrian crossing signal and the deconflicting movements of the bikes and um, cars. And drivers will experience some longer delays and out of direction travel in exchange for clearer turning movements and designated areas for all road users. And so with this, we would like to turn over to the um, question, discussion section. We have, uh, we would love to hear from you about what curiosities you have. And I'll turn it over to Emily. Yeah, so we did um, we did uh, want to kind of highlight a few questions that we we might have anyways, and we wanted to also kind of be able to speak more candidly, maybe out of like presentation format to kind of talk about some of what we thought saw were really kind of unique situations that um, we we um, had to manage. So first was kind of preservation of the view shed, um, right? That there that this this design effort had to be really sensitive while you know. Um, to the to the view shed of the National Mall and its monuments, while also having to achieve a vertical protection between bikes and vehicles. So just wanted to allow Eliza to kind of give some information about more kind of how we approached, you know, CFA, Commission for Fine Arts, and NCPC, National Capital Planning Commission, as the kind of reviewers for um, the vertical protection elements and, and what you um, kind of how we Kind of communicated that. Well, thanks, Emily. I think that um, a couple things really helped us uh, move this project forward. It was, as I mentioned, you know, we had these existing plans that showed um, buy-in early on. Um, number two was this example that's up here on the screen, is that there is a existing uh, cycle track going right through the center of the mall not on NPS Road, but on DDOT Road um, on 4th Street Southwest. So you could go out there and see that there wasn't an impact in the preservation of the view shed. I mean, it was a perfect example because it already existed. And then the third thing that helped um, was this funding that also showed that there was buy-in because that was a grant through the Council of Governments, right, through COG that had to wind its way through DC. So. Um, and then uh, finally was the reality that there was this demand. The demand exists. The Capital Bike Share showed that people were getting out there on the road, wanting to ride. They were the highest used stations. So yes, I think the preservation of the view shed was really important, but because of the 4th Street um, example, um, the, uh, that it really, uh, that really helped us. And in addition, just one more thing, 14th Street is a parallel road and 14th Street is a major um, ingress and egress road through DC. 15th Street is more a monumental road, right? Run by the National Park Service, 
through the park. So it kind of um, it, 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 it kind of defined itself as a place where there should be more of this multimodal enjoying your ride, whereas for, we have 14th Street for the traffic. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think we also wanted to kind of give a, an opportunity to talk more about um, how this project handled relocation of some of the vendors, which previously were um, parked along a curbside lane uh, from basically from the White House to the Constitution Ave. Um, so wanted to let Will elaborate on kind of the, the hurdles here and how they were managed. Sure, and, and we going way back to 2010 when we first installed um, this segment, the, the segment just in the north of here on 15th Street, this is the cycle track that connects to Pennsylvania. Um, the vendors were using the space south of there at that time. And I, I'm not sure when they started, but they've, they've had permits going back for as long as people can remember to, to vend uh, you know, both food and, and merchandise into you know, basically onto the sidewalk next to the next to the White House ellipse area. And so they had this sort of long incumbency period where they've just they've just been there. This is the business. And um, the, one of the more difficult things we deal with in right of way is displacing incumbent users um, and and sticking to our guns when when we do that. We, we did not do that in 2010, uh, even though, you know, I think even then it was clear that the, this facility should be extended south. Um, and so we, we got another bite at the apple uh, this, this past year. And the point I would make is that the, the right of way is, is very unique real estate. It's been preserved for the movement of people, goods, services, uh, in our case, since the 1790s. And, um, and, and that gives you really all the authority you need when you work for a DOT or do this type of planning to, to insist that the, the movement of goods, people, and services is, uh, is more of a priority over, over almost anything else that happens there. And, and that's in fact what we did here. And it was, it was you know, a lot of difficult conversations, um, a lot of institutional sort of de like defenders of the, of the vending, but ultimately the, the, the safe movement of, of cyclists uh, and scooter riders and everybody else that's using this, this facility down the corridor is, is more important. You can see kind of the prior condition here, right? Which is, which is the curbside was, was taken by, by parking, um, tour bus parking was a part of that. Um, but all those things can have other places, right? That one of the, the, the truisms of transportation planning is essentially, you know, uh, modes have to go in a straight line, more or less, or, you know, a continuous line. And, and so there's not really a, another option that we could have exercised um, that, would, that would meet that very basic and obvious criteria. So, um, uh, so we did it and it's working really well. And um, one of the points we made in the vending arguments was uh, there are something like 350 other locations in downtown DC that you can do curbside vending. Um, just not here anymore, um, and so so that's what uh, what we settled on, and it's it's working extremely well uh, so far. Thanks, Will, and and one last um, kind of question discussion before we throw it out to the audience um, for more um, is just kind of to to Drew just about kind of some of the challenges with decision making around new roadway allocation. Anything that hasn't been said before, I know Eliza and Will have touched on it too, but perhaps you know talking through some of the the left turn um, restricted versus free movements. Sure, sure. I think we did mostly speak about this already, but some of the things that we uh, did internally to help make decisions about the safest and best project that could move forward as described, where we did a level of, we did do a level of service evaluation for um, motor vehicles and we brought the results back to um, Will for his review and for, to Eliza for her review and for subsequent, subsequent review by other interested stakeholders in the area. And so it was really effective to have the, um, have the outcome of, the, of what we could predict should traffic volumes return to pre-pandemic levels and firstly say have a consensus around the table that if that happens, that's okay. We're okay with this, the cue back because the resulting safety benefits are more important. Um, we don't expect the traffic volumes to go back to pre-pandemic levels. And so we think that the level of service analysis is actually pretty conservative for what could, what could happen. Um, and then with respect to the, the other thing that was important with respect to the decision-making related to the delay is that the elimination of the free left turns was some left turns was something that Will pointed out would be done regardless of whether this project was in the pipeline or not because the intersections that um, had the free left turn against the um, pedestrian crossing were experiencing high levels of 
uh, crashes involving people walking. And so with the visibility and transparency into that situation, that would have um, been an outcome regardless of whether we could get this additional benefit of having the protected bikeway there. Um, thanks. And so, yeah, thanks everyone for um, coming to our presentation and hearing us share a, a little bit about the project. And um, I did see one question pop up already and I'll turn off my screen, but I think this one probably goes to Eliza. This was a question from Zach D. Uh, really excited for this project. Thank you to all who made it happen. Could you please share some criteria for ViewShed and how it was is measured? So that kind of goes back to that original. Yeah, well, again, we had a lot of review people looking at this project, um, and I think their comments were, um, you know, again, the 4th Street uh, Southwest um, cycle track was already there going right through the center um, of, of the National Mall. And then secondly, I think limiting um, the flex posts. So um, that was a request to keep them solely at the intersections. And, um, you know, in the future, when we finish, when we do the repaving, um, we're going to um, have um, match the materials, um, possibly do the granite um, separator, separating the cycle track with a, a granite separator as opposed to um, what DDOT has put in now. Um, so um, I'm hoping that answers your question, Zach. It's reviewers, it's, yeah. it's, it's showing existing um, what's already you know, an existing situation that had limited impact and uh, looking for uh, like materials in the future. Oh, and he's asking if there's anything written. Um, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm not probably the best person to speak to it, but it's fair to say that there is a level of subjectivity to it. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a role that's delegated to a couple of um, boards and commissions and, and sort of standing bodies of the Washington DC um, certainly the monumental core and, and the larger region to an extent. Um, and so, you know, the, the general guidelines would be like anything that sort of visually distracts from this monumental space that you're, that you're in as a, as a visitor. Um, and, uh, and so anyways, you know, there's a lot of existing things like, you know, maybe busy, busy roads themselves uh, distract from enjoyment of the monumental core. But, um, but when there's a, something new that's coming in, um, we just have to go through it and, and sort of go through and talk about some of the options really. And, and it wasn't like they were, uh, there was ever a risk of the project like not happening because of that. It was just about more of the product choices and some of the, um, some of the fine design details about what it looks like uh, as you, as you, you know, figure out what you can offer and what you can implement. And, you know, there's trade-offs between cost and other things that you, you, you sort of adjudicate in these, uh, in these meetings. And I think the main ones here um, we have a state historic preservation office that we meet with once a month. We have the National Capital Planning Commission um, that, that sees things in the whole greater region. And then we have the Commission for Fine Arts, the Commission of the Fine Arts. Um, among other things they do, they, they review a lot of um, building plans. They review uh, some, some of our roadway plans. They review coinage for the United States. They review any monuments or, or memorials that are going in. So they have a big, a big plate. And um, uh, many ways they fit us into their busy schedules as well. And we, we had a pretty good outcome. And, uh, and I think that's gonna work out very well in the end. Terrific. Thank you all. And um, so I will just note for our participants, we do still have some time on the clock. If you would like to ask any questions of our panel, uh, you can find the Q&A button, which is on the bottom center of the Zoom menu bar, and feel free to type in your question, and we will go ahead and uh, get it answered for you. And if, if there's some dead time, well, we wait for a question to come in. I'll talk about one of the other things that you might not see right away. But um, when you do a project like this, you, you have to think about road dynamics from, you know, sort of a bigger catchment and what happens to lanes that feed into your project. And, uh, and one of the ones, so Main Avenue is, is sort of feeding in, uh, coming, coming eastbound, and then it turns to southbound as it goes around the tidal basin. And, we, and one of my prouder things is we actually took a lane off of Main Avenue um, it was one that just like appears after after uh, diverts from from independence. And because of that extra lane, it caused a really thorny pedestrian problem right at the sort of project limit for us, a double threat uh, pedestrian crossing where you know two lanes are coming at you and the um, I think this crowd probably knows, but it basically 
if car one stops for you, car two doesn't always know why that person stopped because it can't see around the car. And that's called a double threat. And we were able to eliminate that second lane and therefore eliminating the double threat crash risk in that location. And, um, and we have a couple more that are gonna come in the phase that's, that's happening in the spring on East Basin Drive that will be eliminating sort of these double threat conditions. Um, so, you know, it's a bike project, but that's exactly like the kind of pedestrian safety feature we put into it. And it's, it's sort of hard to notice, right? Because it's about, you know, roadway dynamics and, um, and how they all come together. But, but that's one of the ones I'm, I'm very proud of this whole team for, for, for sticking to and, and getting behind and finding a solution. Thank you. Uh, there's another question, but I'll just pile on, Will, with respect to the design um, fluidity that we experienced, I guess, what there, as we were evaluating the state providing the best design, best and safest design for the, um, for the project, the team, you know, came up with some solutions around the transit stops that are used by the circulator primarily, and there was an initial um, design that we all agreed wouldn't suit the the protected bike lane project, and so there was an so we designed the um, bikeway to go behind the transit islands, creating a floating transit island. But and that's not so revol revolutionary, but that you were able to get that 100% condition built into the project during this kind of quick build project that was capitalizing on the pavement maintenance program was really an exceptional um, process that we don't see very often. It really took a team effort on that one and it worked out great in the end. So I, I couldn't be happier. Um, there is another question here that we got um, that asked about, is uh, NPS planning additional protected bike infrastructure on the mall? I don't know, Eliza, if you have any insight into that work. Well, um, right now under construction is the um, trail next to the Rock Creek Parkway um, that uh, we are working on and um, and it is a connection at the same time DDOT is completing or maybe you already completed will the Virginia Avenue so that'll be a great connection um, that connects to the National Mall both the Virginia Avenue cycle track which is DDOT and um, redoing the um, Rock Creek Parkway path along the Potomac River which connects to the Kennedy Center's new pedestrian bridge and then connects to 66. And also a part of the Rock Creek Parkway project is we are actually went through the bridge abutment, which was DDOT's bridge, um, went through the Teddy Roosevelt Bridge abutment, which is 66 to enlarge, so you're so to enlarge the trail so the trail you're not pushed over to the river. I mean pushed over to the Rock Creek Parkway. Um, so that's one thing that's happening right now. Um, number two, as a part of the, this project, um, 15th Street, um, this spring, I guess, they'll be completing East Basin Drive, um, which will be a connection all the way down to the 14th Street Bridge. So that, so a lot of these things happen, don't happen independently. They happen with road repaving. So now when you repave a road, you're not just looking at the roads, you're looking at the pedestrian connections, the multimodal connections. So East Basin Drive is uh, another one. And in addition, um, the National Mall is doing a study now to so that um, we're ahead of the curve and looking at some of these connections before the repavings and looking at a couple of the areas where there have been conflicts over the past and have kind of complicated 1960s or older roadways like Lincoln Memorial Circle, Jefferson and Madison Drives, and of course, Haynes Point. Um, so this, those are some of the areas that have been highlighted um, to be studied and are being studied right now. And, and, and there's, there's more beyond those ones, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accidentally do the announcement on, uh, in this forum. Um, there, there was, a, so, so I'll let, um, it'll be either Park Service or DDOT or some joint press release when we're sort of uh, at the point of announcing what, what we've been working on, but, but uh, you know, I'll never tell. Um, the, there was a question that came in on uh, the Q&A and it was about, did we consider raising the cycle track to sidewalk grade um, as one of the options since, since part of this was gonna be repaved. And, and so I answered it in there if you wanna see, but the, the, uh, we, we always think about that. Um, we have one, actually two sort of sidewalk level cycle tracks in the city. There's one on Virginia Avenue Southeast and there's one on um, uh, Main Avenue Southeast by the wharf. Um, and they, they, they work a little bit differently. Um, they have some different dynamics, especially when there's like a lot of curbside activity. But the, the main reason 
we kind of quickly dismissed it as when you do those, you, you have to think about relocating every ramp that you encounter, every curb ramp you encounter along the corridor, every drainage basin, every manhole cover, um, you have to raise it. And so you end up with like a, this, this enormous list of civil infrastructure changes. And that's what's expensive, right? That's where you need an excavator to dig up the road. And, um, and then on top of that, when you do that kind of level of work, you, you end up getting into um, sort of stormwater permitting for the construction period. And there's a there's sort of like an easy permit that's if it's under, I want to say 5,000 or 6,000 square feet of disturbance. And that's all our bus platforms are under that um, in aggregate. Um, but if we did the raise the whole thing, it would have definitely been over that threshold. And so um, it becomes a much bigger project. The, the program I normally work with um, is, you know, our limits are basically between the existing curbs. And then once in a while we'll modify something uh, beyond that, like a bus platform or things like that. But but in general, to keep it affordable and quick, right? There, there's a there's an opportunity cost to to having long delays um, between like planning and impl implementation. We were able to do this project within um, you know within a year essentially because we went at it with like you know let's let's start with the the curbs are fixed. We're going to leave those where they are. Um, and you know like Drew said, adding the bus platforms was like a pretty big a pretty big lift for us. But uh, but that's why some of the decision to leave it at grade. And, and we also could create a sufficient level of uh, protection, both with the concrete blocks and, and wheel stops and, and hopefully future uh, granite barriers that we're gonna put. Um, it's also like a three or four foot wide buffer between where cars are moving and where, where bikes are moving. So you have a very comfortable place to ride your bike and it's consistent with the rest of the facility uh, further north here. Yeah, we did have another question. Um about what particular NPS concerns were raised over um, their segment of the right-of-way improvements. I think, you know, maybe, Eliza, this is time that we can kind of share a little bit about how we um, spoke with Secret Service and the White House, um, specifically at the intersection of Pennsylvania Ave, and there were kind of some iterations of sharing the design. And Yeah, I mean, we had iterations of sharing the design, as, as Emily said, in front of the White House. Um, it, it did go by the entrance. Um, they were supportive of it. Um, um, other concerns is, as Drew and Will have mentioned, were the bus pull-offs. We have, um, in addition to um, Circulator and our big bus, our Circulator is our public, is our um, relationship, our partnership with DDOT um, to provide um, um, public transit. So it's a dollar a ride. Um, we have about 500,000 riders. So how will that work with those riders? Big Bus is our interpretive tour around the National Mall. In addition, we have an, a large amount of events that happen um, off of 15th Street. So working with our, the National Mall's permit division, they have over 4,000 events, many of which happen on the, on the Washington Monument grounds. So how will... Um, how will these people load and unload these massive, you know, like the recent flags, right? The recent COVID flags, how will they unload and load and people being there? So those are kind of some of the issues. And as Will brought up, I mean, how will, will the traffic still flow or are maintenance people be able to get there? So all these questions were raised and um, with the um, having a really good design team, um, I think helped a lot because, um, you know, between Nelson Nygaard and Kittleson, we could pick up the phone. I did a couple times and said, hey, can you talk to my management about how this works or this works? And they would explain it. They have a lot of experience as well as DDOT. So I think that really helped is having, um, you know, a group that's talented um, behind the scenes or running this. And yeah, and to add on that, yeah. just, oh, specifically like for the, for the turnoffs on 15th Street, you know, that was that was in the design details, right? Making sure that the, you know, installed, you know, curb stops wouldn't, would be able to be located and spaced um, well enough so that a truck could pull in at the mall to serve those kind of special event situations. And then uh, kind of back to, you know, the Pennsylvania Ave, E Street um, connection point, you know, especially being able to show kind of drawings and show that there, there doesn't have to be any curbs it, it was just uh, you know, a painted green square that would essentially serve as the dwelling time for, for bikes. Um, and yeah, just, just this weekend, I you know, got, in front of, uh, got in front of a Secret Service van while we were both waiting for the light and it worked out seamlessly and they you know, followed me out of the light. Um, not followed me, but yeah, like proceeded <laughs> after I went. So 
So yeah, so it, it works well in practice. And I think a lot of it, you know, Eliza being there and being able to say, um, this these are the partners we're going to be meeting with. This is the type of information and the level and depth of information that we need to see right now in order to like move to the next step was was really helpful in that process. And Sorry, I, Will. Another, one other thing about NPS coordination that was really helpful is early on we involved the, the permit managers for the, the, the mall so that they could understand what was coming. And then by the time we, we needed to get a permit, like it was really quick because they they didn't have to understand the project it just needed to, to sort of like you know sign sign the paperwork and it was really important because um uh, i think this isn't confessing everything anything but like the way our asset management repaving operation works is you don't always know when they're going to get to a certain segment and they can try to just tell you like hey we've started and so and we'll be done in at the end of this week you know they go pretty quickly repaving streets and um uh and so we had to be ready to to uh to react to that and get permits going and, and start the project and uh, and get contractors out there that you know had a finished plan and were uh, you know ready with everything that they needed to uh, to get this this um, this new striping plan the new because signage goes with it too you have to change a lot of signs um, so a lot of things kind of have to ch happen very quickly once you finally get that go ahead and uh, park service was there ready to go and and uh, and that's why you see the 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 quick implementation compared to, you know, we were having public meetings in, um, I think we had one in January and another one in March last year. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we turned it around really quickly compared to the normal timeline um, between like when we're presenting to the public and implementing it's, it's normally much, much, much longer, um, especially for like big capital things. So, um, so anyways, the value of coordination is high. I think there's some in the chat. Let's see if there's any. Okay. Yeah, so I'm happy to read them out for you. Sure, so the next question, Jane asks, what is the width of each lane of the cycle track on a two-way track? Um, we have a minimum width of uh, eight feet of sort of operational space, so four feet in each direction. Um, that's our minimum at DDOT. Uh, there's maybe a couple cycle tracks in town that are that are at the minimum for different parts of them or uh, but in this case, we were well above that throughout. And I think the widest point, if you include the, the buffer space, I think there are parts that are there are 14 or 15 feet wide, um, like as you approach Main Avenue. And so generally you have at least 10 feet, like between the two lanes, north and south. And sometimes you have 12 feet within that, plus the three foot buffer. So it's, it's definitely one of the wider cycle tracks that we've built. Um, I, th I think yeah, 16 feet at certain points is is definitely going to be the like the widest that we have in the city, um, and it's it changes right because like the road geometry might change for the uh, at the intersection a little bit or something like that. So uh, there's not like one consistent, but we're always above that eight foot minimum. I think we, the minimum distance is maybe like nine at one point um, or ten uh, with the buffer as well. So there's there's always separation from from the moving uh, motor vehicle traffic, which is which is really one of the key features that makes these comfortable places to, to, to bike and scoot. Yeah, and there were, we did receive some comments about pedicabs and making sure that we, um, like they, they could be accommodated within the cycle track and that definitely, you know, you know, we went down and looked at the paper and made sure that those, those widths, especially where through the bus bays, where it is kind of that raised concrete curb um, continuously that, that they could be accommodated. So. Yeah, two pedicabs can pass each other at that point, uh, going each direction. They have at the axles or at the fenders, they're like 50 inches wide. So um, so it's 100 inches. Uh, I think we ended up with like 120 inches at that point. So we're, we're well above, it's like Panamax, right? Like what's the, big, <laughs> the biggest ship you have to fit through the Panama Canal? It's like we, we had pedicabs fitting through bus platforms. So, so that's like our design minimum. And um, we also put uh, flex posts at like every point that a car could enter the cycle track. So there's a yellow set, usually of flex posts. Um, we do plow these in the winter as part of our maintenance agreement. We salt and plow depending on, you know, the snow conditions. We might use brine or something else too. But, um, but that, what, the reason why I use flex posts and not um, like, a, like a fixed in place bollard is so we can actually get over those points and, and get this uh, plowed so that it's useful, um, you know, throughout all seasons and can, because we do have commuting by bike and, and recreational rides by bike in all seasons. So we want to make sure that we're able to uh, maintain it throughout whatever weather conditions that occur here. Very impressive. Glad to know. 
Okay, it looks like our last question, Chris asks, was all of the coordination among agencies done remotely due to COVID protocols? Did it make things easier or more challenging? I have actually never met Drew in person. I think that's, that's, I don't think we've ever met in person. So yes, it was true. all. I thought, you, I thought you guys met when she did like the CNO Canal Trail. God, Emily's memory is better than both of maybe, ours, but not maybe. for this project. Not for this project. <laughs> um, so anyways, that, that, it, it, yes, it was all virtual. Um, we had a couple like on-site meetings where maybe like three or four people from NPS and DDOT and, and, and the project team that's uh, like Emily's in town um, would meet on site to just go over once one or two things or like a signal, uh, a signal change or something like that. But um, I think it probably made it easier. I, I think it really does make it easier when you can get people from all around the country that are experts in different parts of their, uh, their respective fields and, and sort of agree on a time and just be there without the, the transportation logistics. Um, you know, and most of the time we, we went back to the office in uh, July, but most of the time I was like in my living room or in my, you know, in my uh, study, which is like our guest room, um, talking about this stuff or, or doing the public meetings. And our public meetings, we had better attendance. Um, I think we had 120 at one of them, 120 participants, which is like better than we, we get doing live in-person ones in, in like a church basement or like a meeting hall somewhere. So it really speaks to the sort of new nature of work that we've, uh, you know, we, we were forced to sort of embrace it wholly over the past 20 months or so. And, and it really has some benefits that I don't think we should, uh, and I don't think anyone's interested in going back to like, yeah, we must have Tuesday night public meeting in like a downtown meeting hall that everyone has to appear at in person to get their two cents in. Um, so with others might have, have some, some other thoughts on it, but, but it really works for us pretty well. I think from the um, consultant perspective that what worked remarkably well was the ability to have a standing meeting with our stakeholders that was easy for them to get to. And so when we had meetings to discuss the tricky spots or pinch points where we needed to make some decisions about anything from a design perspective, we were um, there was an expectation that we had this regular meeting. And in contrast to some projects which go on and on because people maybe aren't able to come to the meetings for conflicting reasons. This culture of the online meetings really um, worked for this team because we had folks being able to pop into the meetings and have them on their calendars and again, see them, see the plans in real time as opposed to circulate them throughout the building for, for review and comment. Um, it was uh, it was hard for us not to be for me as a project manager across the country not to be able to go out to the field to discuss some of the tricky spots the signals in particular but um, and also the bus laybys but uh, overall I'm I'm sure it's a factor in our quick success in getting the design complete and on time. Terrific. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think we will wrap it up there. Um, on behalf of the chapter. I want to thank all of you, Emily, Eliza, Drew, and Will, for presenting on this really great topic today. I learned a whole bunch myself. Uh, so just a couple of uh, final reminders. So first of all, I apologize, but the CM link for CM credit in the agenda was actually pointing to another session. So I have posted in the chat the corrected link. So um, you can go ahead and follow that one that um, does connect to this, this session. Uh, finally, just like to let you all know, we have one more session in this afternoon's virtual conference at 4 p.m. Please join us again for Past, Present, Future, a look at St. Elizabeth's East and West campuses. Uh, we look forward to seeing you online then, and uh, I will go ahead and wrap it up. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.